in this zone. Only exceptional faculty usually get, get it. And also, I am LS. I think this is a museum and a library service. And there's a Mora Bush 21st century library program, also she got that grant too. So she has over, over 1.1 million dollars grant. And uh, she's uh, really uh, here for Kai conference, for the Human Computer Interaction uh, Conference. And it's, uh, it's wonderful she can spend some time with us. Let's welcome her. talking to you about uh, the book that I recently wrote with uh, my former advisor, Howard Gardner. And this book really represents a synthesis of research that um, we have been conducting with our colleagues at the Harvard Graduate School of Education for the last several years. Um, and we've been researching the role of digital media technologies in different aspects of young people's lives. Um, but really the seeds for the book were planted even before I got to Harvard. I came to Harvard in 2005, but before that I was an elementary school teacher. Um, and in the early to mid-2000s when I was a teacher, it was becoming very clear to me that technology was becoming increasingly central to how young people live their lives, how they express themselves, how they interact with other people, and how they learn about the world around them. Um, and so I thought there are a lot of really interesting questions that you can ask about what's the impact of digital media technologies on young people's development. Um, so I was very lucky that when I came to Harvard, Howard was starting to ask some similar questions. Um, we started off uh, on a project called the Good Play Project, and it looked at um, the moral and ethical dimensions of young people's digital media use. And then we decided to expand our focus to different aspects of young people's development. Um, so their identity development, their social development, and also their creative expression. Um, and we developed a project called the Developing Minds um, and Digital Media Project. And really, in that project, we sought to answer a very big question that I'm not sure that we really answer it completely in the book, but it's an interesting question to consider. How are young people today different, if at all, from young people growing up in a pre-digital era? And during the course of our research, we came to an important realization. So whereas earlier generations have typically been defined by major political or economic events, so specific wars like the World Wars, the Korean War, um, the Great Depression in the United States, this generation of young people tends to be more defined by the technologies they use and actually define themselves by the different technologies they use. Um, now, apps weren't part of the air that we breathed when we first started this research back in 2007. Um, but as the iPhone was introduced that same year, um, and the slogan, there's an app for that, became a common saying, we started to realize that apps were actually a very fitting metaphor for what we were seeing in our research which is why we called the book The App Generation. And throughout the book, and also in my talk today, um, we go in and out of speaking very literally about specific apps, but we also speak metaphorically about um, key defining characteristics of apps and how those characteristics exemplify various themes that we found in our research. So in the book, we argue that young people growing up today are not just immersed in apps. Now here, speaking metaphorically, it's almost as if they've come to see the world as a collection of apps, their lives as a string of ordered apps. And in the book, we introduce the idea of an app mentality that many of today's young people seem to exhibit. And the app mentality suggests that whatever desire or question um, that anyone has should be satisfied and answered immediately by the appropriate app. 
And if the appropriate doesn't exist, well then, easy. We'll just make one, and then the problem is solved. But if no app can be imagined or created for that original question, then maybe that original question or desire just shouldn't or doesn't matter. But the good, big question is, is this app mentality good or is it bad? A world permeated by apps is in many ways a wonderful one. I love my apps, I'm sure you do too. I use apps to make plans with friends, to help me find my way around in an unfamiliar location, to listen to music, even to wake me up in the morning, which is very important for the 16 hour time change here in Seoul. Um, apps are great if they can take care of these ordinary things and free us up to pursue more important matters. They're also great as they increasingly become tools for us for productive work, um, help us to stay connected with our friends and family, and even introduce us to new experiences. So it's our contention that when apps are used in this way, kind of as entry points, um, or jumping off points to new experiences, they can be app enabling, and this is a wonderful thing. But there's a less optimistic view of apps. There's a danger that we become overly dependent on apps for the answers, for social connection, even for our sense of ourselves. There's a danger that we start to look to apps first before we look inside of ourselves. And if this happens, if we start to see more of our apps than ourselves and our experiences, our actions, and our self-expressions, it's our argument that we have become app-dependent. So in our research with colleagues at Harvard, Howard and I have considered this tension between app-enabling on the one hand and app-dependence on the other, within three areas of experience that are particularly salient for young people. That is their sense of personal identity, who they are, their intimate relationships with other people, particularly friends and parents, and also the way they express their imaginative powers, their, create, their creative potential. So we call these the three I's of identity, intimacy, and imagination. And in the book, we really explore how young people experience these three I's. And to, to make sense of it, we collected data from a wide variety of sources, because we're asking a very big question. Are today's young people different in any way than young people growing up in a pre-digital era? So we started off, we conducted this research at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, so we're very much ensconced in um, uh, education, and so we decided to start by talking to teachers themselves. So we talked to 40 veteran high school teachers who have been teaching for at least 20 years, and we just asked them, what's new? Have you noticed anything different in your 20 and 25 years teaching um, about young people and about the way they learn and about the way they interact with other people. And we didn't say anything about digital media at the beginning. Um, but it, invariably, they brought it up themselves. And then we probed and we asked them a little bit more about it. Um, but it was very interesting how within minutes of our interview starting, they mentioned technology and the impact of technology on young people. We then conducted some focus groups with other educators, again, who had been working with for at least 20 years with young people. Um, but these educators were in different areas. So the first group that we started talking with, they were classroom teachers. The other, this, in the focus groups, we talked with camp counselors who had been spending time with kids in the summers for at least 20 years. We talked to religious leaders. We talked to after school teachers, art teachers. Um, and so we, and we really wanted to get a very comprehensive, full view of young people in their different settings, not just in school. Um, and then we looked at what young people had actually produced themselves over the last 20 years. From 1990 to 2011, we analyzed um, fiction writing, creative writing from middle school and high school students. And we also looked at visual art that they had created during the same period of time. And we, we did a very comprehensive analysis that I'll describe in a little bit of um, all these different pieces and what trends we were able to detect over the 20 year period. And then finally, we talked to young people. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't create a time machine and go back and interview young people from the early 1990s. Um, but we talked to a lot of young people, over 2,000 young people living right now, just asking them 
what technologies they use, how does technology help or hinder different parts of their lives. Um, and in the book, we use this research to explore how the app mentality manifests in each of the three eyes of identity, intimacy, and imagination. So what I'm going to do now is take each eye in turn and share some key themes um, that emerged from our research that we discuss in the book. So first, starting with identity. So if we set aside for a moment what apps actually do, consider what apps look like. So consider the visual icon associated with a particular app. So maybe the Facebook app or the Twitter bird, the Wikipedia W. I'm sure that at least one of these logos comes immediately to mind. Um, and it really suggests that these app logos are highly evocative of a particular brand. And they illustrate the fact that apps are fundamentally tied up in their external packaging and visual representation. And similarly, it appears that the identities of today's young people are increasingly externally packaged. So that is, they're developed and they're put forth so that they convey a certain desirable image of themselves um, to a particular audience. And this identity is not unlike the branded icon of an app. And apps um, and the uh, social media platforms they provide access to seem to really encourage this emphasis on personal packaging and branding. So if you think about the emergence in recent years of selfies, of status updates, the idea of becoming <coughs> Twitter famous or a Vine star, all of these um, are evidence of this trend towards personal packaging and the packaged self. So one effect of this packaging, this emphasis on performing to external audiences, is that focus on the inner life may be minimized. So including time for reflecting on your values, your goals, and your dreams. Now on a more distinctly positive note, today's youth have opportunities to explore a wider variety of identities in all the different kinds of online communities that you can find. So their communities devoted to music, fan culture, civic engagement, and gaming. Uh, just about any interest you can think of, um, you'll find a community online that, that relates to that interest. And this type of identity exploration is an important part of youth development, provided that it doesn't harm the self or others. And it also appears from our research that youth today are more accepting and welcoming of a wider variety of identities in other people. So whether those identities are related to race, sexual orientation, or just personal interests. And it seems reasonable to suspect that the internet and social media platforms have played an important role here, helping to connect you to people across various geographic and cultural boundaries, and in the process, expanding their knowledge and understanding of people who are different from them. So with respect to intimacy, we found that, and this is no surprise, uh, that youth are always connected, um, both to their friends and their parents. So let's talk a little bit about parents, because that might not be quite as obvious. Um, so we have found in our research and reviewing the research of others, that today's young people are connected to a greater degree and also for a longer time to their parents. Now, in many ways, this is a very positive development, and there's evidence that parents and their children seem to be closer than ever. That's terrific. Um, but how much connection is too much, especially during adolescence and emerging adulthood, when, at least in Western cultures, there, an important developmental task is to gain a sense of autonomy and identity that is distinct from your parents and your family. So consider one study that we came across during the course of our research, and it found that college kids on average are in contact with their parents 13.4 times per week. Um, now when I was in college, it was very different. I may be called home once a week or once every other week, and it tended to be a fairly long conversation, maybe 30 minutes, and I would update my parents on what I had done for the last week. But these 13 times, usually, you know, they're text messages or quick phone calls, just kind of checking in, maybe getting advice from parents on what class you should take or, you know, what you should have for breakfast or something. It's a very different kind of exchange. And in our research, with, um, with the educators, one of the camp directors told us that parents will often send their children to camp with two cell phones. 
So one cell phone you have to give up to the camp personnel because there's a rule <laughs> you can't have cell phones. The other cell phone is meant to be kept under your pillow so that parents can stay in constant contact with their children. Um, so there's a scholar at MIT named Sherry Turkland. She calls this this way of using um, the cell phone a tether so that children and their parents can remain in constant communication and constant contact. It doesn't provide a lot of room for kids to make mistakes on their own or get lost or just figure things out for themselves. So with respect to friends, um, digital media allow young people to stay in constant communication as we know with their friends, um, but constant connection doesn't always translate into deep connection. And it's hard to connect deeply to any one person when you're trying to juggle and keep up with your hundreds of friends or, and followers who are spread across many different social media platforms, all while you're trying to do your homework, maybe listening to music or watching a show on Netflix or Hulu. And related to this, we've witnessed a certain reluctance among youth to show vulnerability in their face-to-face -face interactions. After all, it's much easier to share personal feelings at an arm's length and through a screen rather than by looking at someone eye to eye. I can consider the connection to apps. Apps are ultimately shortcuts, so they take you straight to what you're looking for. There's no need to perform a web search. And when it comes to relationships, such shortcuts can make interacting with other people much quicker, much easier, and also less threatening because if the conversation starts to get too personal, you can just close out the app and you're safe. Now, if these shortcuts are used in moderation and to augment existing relationships, um, they can and they do uh, support meaningful relationships, and we find a lot of evidence for this in our research. But if they're used to replace rather than augment, or if they start to get in the way of sustained, deep communication, apps may facilitate superficial ties and lead to relationships that are more transactional rather than transformational. So consider an app that is quite popular in the United States. I'm not sure if you have it here in um, Korea. Do you have Tinder? I'm not sure. Maybe not. Anyway, it's a dating app. Um, by, by the look of some people's faces, you have heard of it. Uh, but basically, it's a very pared down dating app. Um, it's based on geolocation, and it shows you just pictures and very basic facts of people in your immediate area. And you basically just swipe through the images, and if you find someone attractive, you swipe right. If you find them not so attractive, too bad for them, you swipe left. Um, and if two people swipe each other right, then there's a match, and you may end up meeting um, offline. Now, of course, there's nothing to say that this app couldn't lead to meaningful in-person relationships. But anecdotal evidence suggests that many young people, and also adults, are using it as a way to facilitate casual hookups. So in other, way, in other words, purely transactional one-time interactions. Okay, so on to the final eye of imagination. Now a sizable portion of the app ecology is devoted to supporting creative artistic production. So there are apps for painting, photography, musical composition, filmmaking, just about any artistic genre you can think of there is an app for that. And digital media in general have opened up new avenues for young people to express themselves creatively. And these avenues are much quicker, they're easier, and also they're cheaper than they ever have been before. And, and as a result, they've really lowered um, the floor so that more young people can become involved in creative pursuits. And they've also raised the ceiling with respect to what's possible for young people to create. However, it's important to consider the fact that app developers constrain artistic expressions in specific ways based on the coding decisions that they make when they're designing their app. So, for instance, if you're using a painting app, your color palette is limited to the hues that the designer programmed into the app. It's similarly, if you're using a music composition app, your tonal range, again, will be limited um, to, the, to the tones that the app developer programmed in. Now, of course, sophisticated users, many of them young people, can create their own workarounds and break free from the constraints of the underlying code. But realistically, most people will work within the parameters of the original app.
This raises important questions about how such digital boundaries affect the creative process. So which is it? Techn is technology supporting or undermining youth creativity? So I've kind of set it up where it could go either way. In some respects, it seems that there are more possibilities than ever to express yourself creatively. And on the other hand, there are these underlying constraints. And so we were really interested in this question on our project. And what we did is we decided to look directly at what young people had produced over the last 20 years. And we looked in two domains in particular. We looked at visual art, and we also looked at um, fiction writing. So I'm going here, I'll go into a little bit more detail about our methods and some of the key findings um, from this work. So we drew our visual art sample from a teen literary and art magazine that has been published since 1989 by the same husband and wife um, editorial team. And we developed a very complex coding scheme um, with 18 separate codes, and in total we coded over 350 pieces of artwork. Half of them were from the early 1990s, and half of them were from the more recent years. And here's just a sampling of some of the artwork that we got to look at. It was a really fun project looking at all of the different artwork that young people had created over the last 20 years. And as I mentioned, we created a very detailed coding scheme. Um, actually, we had two graduate students who had fine arts training. Um, they developed this coding scheme based on um, specific aspects of, um, of painting. And so I'm not going to, there's no need to read all of these codes, but um, I'm just going to highlight three codes in particular um, to give you a sense of the main themes that we were finding. Because what we did is we basically, for every piece of artwork, we broke, them, we broke it down and we looked at very specific parts of the artwork. We looked at how they had changed over the last 20 years, and then we kind of put it back together again to see what the overall story was. So one of the codes that we looked at um, was background. So in other words, we were interested to know how, what was going on in the background of these paintings. Were, was there just a blank canvas in the background, or were they filled out in some way? And what we found was that the earlier pieces, the ones that had been um, created in the early 1990s tended to be on blank backgrounds or just partially rendered backgrounds. Whereas the more recent pieces tended to have a lot more going on in the background. They were more fully rendered. We also looked at composition, so where on the visual plane the figures were positioned. Um, and what we found here was the earlier pieces tended more or less to be centrally um, located. Whereas the more recent pieces um, that you see on the right, as an example, tended to be off-center and display stylized cropping. And lastly, we, we looked at medium. Um, that we classified a whole bunch of different media that young people had used to create their visual art. So, and we coded them generally into the more traditional media like pen and ink, um, painting, drawing, and then the more non-traditional, such as collage and digital art and found objects. What we found was um, the earlier pieces tended to have more traditional media, but by and large they tended to be pen and ink, whereas the more recent pieces tended to display more non-traditional media, um, such as mixed media, as this one shows, um, collage and found objects. So when we looked at all the codes together then, they pointed to a growing complexity in teens' visual artwork between 1990 and 2011. But what about creative writing? We analyzed writing from high schoolers and middle school students, um, again, that were produced in the same time period between 1990 and 2011. And like the visual art, we created a very complex coding scheme um, based on uh, typical literary conventions. Um, and again, I will just go into some more detail in some of the codes to give you a sense of the main findings. So one of the, um, the main codes that we looked at for this um, literary work was genre. Um, so we wanted, we classified every story according to what genre it was. Was it historical fiction? Um, was it an absurdist story? Maybe an epistle? All these different kinds of genres. And, and then we looked, and what we found was that the earlier pieces um, tended to have more fantasy elements in them. They tended to be more surreal and absurdist. Um, 
Whereas the more recent pieces tended to be a little bit more um, sticking towards realism. So as an example, um, I remember one of the stories that we coded uh, in the earlier, early 1990s, um, it featured a protagonist who went to see his therapist, and his therapist was a crab. And they had this very strange conversation. And then at the end of their therapy session, the narrator um, picked up his therapist crab with a pair of tongs and took him home to boil him. So very strange kind of story. And a lot of these stories were like that from the early 1990s. Another one, um, there was featured, there was a city, and one day everyone woke up and they went outside, and all of a sudden there had, uh, was a big dome over the city um, that was a mirror reflecting all of the crime and corruption in, that was present in the city. So very creative, very kind of out there types of stories. Whereas the more recent stories, the ones that were written in 2009, 2010, 2011, um, those, you know, if it had been written by a high school student, the main character tended to be a high school student. And it tended to be, uh, the story tended to take place at a high school or, you know, some place that was very realistic. Um, so it definitely it stuck more towards um, the everyday. We also looked at structure. So, um, how, does the, how is the story structured and how does it unfold over time? And what we found was in the earlier pieces, there were a lot more stories that followed non-linear paths, kind of bouncing back and forth in time. Or they just had no um, story progression at all. They were more just a sketch of something. Whereas the more recent pieces tended to follow a basic linear progression. So this happened, then this happened, then this happened sort of thing. We also looked at voice, um, so the narration, was it narrated in the first person, second person, third person? The earlier pieces tended to be narrated more in the first and second person, whereas the more recent pieces were typically the third person, and that tends to be more aligned with the traditional um, type of writing. And then we looked at language, because there's a lot of talk about how digital media and the internet um, may be changing how young people speak and communicate. Um, the idea of net speak. And so we wanted to look at, it. would we find any evidence of this change in language in the writing? Um, now, when we analyzed it, we didn't find any net speak. So we, there was no LOLs or BRBs or anything like that. Um, but we did find differences. So the earlier pieces, they, while they tended to be more absurdist and surreal, their language was more formal. Um, whereas the more recent pieces, there was a lot more slang, um, curse words, and made up words. Um, so the language was noticeably different. So overall, we see two divergent patterns. Um, the visual art we found in our sample was becoming increasingly complex and less conventional. Whereas the creative writing was tended to have less experimentation and a greater adherence to the everyday and the mundane. So, as Marshall McLuhan would say, the takeaway is that the medium really does matter. Um, so, in, at least in our sample, we see more evidence of increasing graphic imagination and perhaps decreasing literary imagination. And if we think about this in terms of the role of digital media, now, we cannot draw a straight line between our findings here and digital media, but um, we enjoyed many conversations in our research lab talking about, well, are there any connections to digital media? Are there any connections to other trends in society over the last 20 years? So we were thinking um, that if we think about visual art, with digital media, there are so many new tools of production, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, many of them are quite cheap, so there's greater access to a lot of new tools that are quite sophisticated. And this really does open up new possibilities for creative expression. Um, and also, there's the internet. And the internet has had the effect of expanding our exposure to different um, visual art. So, and so that might provide a source of inspiration for young people. Now, with respect to writing, it's hard for us, we, we, talk to, we debate about this a lot. Um, it's hard to tell if kids are writing less than they used to, but the type of writing that they're doing, at least online, is often quick, it's very fleeting and very casual. If you think about 
um, tweets, very, very quick and fleeting, um, and very much tied to the everyday and the mundane. It's also worth noting, this is something that we talked a lot about, again, we're at an education school and we're very aware of trends in education over the last 20 years. Um, and in the United States, there has been a clear trend towards increased standardized testing. Um, and I understand that that is a very strong evidence, um, emphasis here in Korea as well. Um, and at least in the United States, we think that one impact of this emphasis on teaching to the test and really mastering and, and excelling at the test is that it doesn't provide a lot of freedom for making mistakes or creative expression. And so if you're thinking about writing, the emphasis is really on mastering that perfect five paragraph essay rather than trying out something a little bit more risky and, and risk not getting a very good grade. So a final reflection on creativity. Um, creativity scholars sometimes talk about big C creativity and little c creativity. Um, so big C creativity really is all about the truly groundbreaking original works of art that can move a um, domain forward and change it permanently. So works by Stravinsky, Picasso, Martha Graham, they all created very important works in music, painting, and dance that fundamentally change those domains forever. In contrast, little c creativity is found everywhere, every day. Um, you and I engage in little c creativity all the time when we adapt to um, unexpected events in our day and just daily problem solving. That's little c creativity. So our research has led us to conjecture that digital media may be giving rise to and actually probably allowing more people to engage in a middle C creativity that is definitely more interesting and impressive than little c creativity, but due to built-in software constraints and also obstacles to deep engagement with multitasking, it's decidedly less groundbreaking than big C creativity. Now to be sure, there's a place for all three forms of creativity in any society, but the truly types of disruptive, groundbreaking innovations that move societies forward rely particularly on big C creativity. Okay, so back to apps. Howard and I are often asked to identify apps that um, are enabling and apps that promote dependence. And the answer that we give is that any app can be used in a more or less dependent or enabling way, um, depending on how you approach it. Um, however, many of the apps that we have sampled, particularly education apps, tend to lean towards dependence. So the sort of, you know, drill and kill math problems type of thing. That's that are very constrained. So just to give you one example of a particular app that can be used in more of a dependent way or more of an enabling way, um, consider this, this is a drawing app called Doodle Buddy. And let's take a look first at the app enabled uh, version. So with this app you start with the uh, opening interface and really you, you're given a blank canvas and you're given an option to sh choose your colors and your um, your, whether you're going to draw with a brush or chalk, so you, you're limited to some extent there, but then you just get to draw freely, and you can draw anything you want, um, and end up with a masterpiece such as this. Um, however, there are certain settings on this very same app that are more aligned with app dependence. So again, we start with the same interface, but this time, you have a bunch of prefabricated images and backgrounds to choose from. So you just choose a background, you plop it on your canvas, then you choose some, some images, again you just arrange them the way you want, and the result is sort of a paint-by-numbers um, picture. So what can we do as educators, parents, designers of apps? and other technologies to tilt the balance more towards using apps in an enabling way, and more broadly speaking, to encourage youth to live their lives in an app-enabling way, and not give up their agency to their digital devices. So first, we believe it's important for adults to look at their own behavior and their own use of technology, and to model app enablement, and model moderation in technology use. So adults are very powerful models for young people, for better or for worse. 
they're watching us. They're watching us with what we're doing with our phones and our tablets and our laptops. So it's important for us to reflect on the habits that we have developed with technology um, and show kids that there's a time to put these devices away and be fully present in the moment. We think it's also important to provide app-enabled experiences that really emphasize open-ended exploration and personal initiative over the more top-down structured and constrained activities. And this really applies to both online and offline experiences. So I am at the University of Washington at the Information School. There's a very strong emphasis on technology and teaching computational skills. Um, but Howard and I feel that it's important not just for people at an information school to learn computational skills, but for all young people to learn some basic computational skills so that they can really understand what technology does and does not allow them to do and how it may constrain their actions in particular ways. And finally, designers of technology, they also have a responsibility to consider how their apps are likely to be used. Now, you never can anticipate exactly how your creation is going to be used by other people. Um, but it is important, we think, to at least consider in the design process, does this app, does this piece of technology um, really constrain people, or does it encourage them to put their personal mark on the technology and really explore in an open-ended way? So to give you a sense of what a big impact educators and parents can have on kids' dispositions towards app enablement or app dependence, consider this study that we came across during the research for this book. Um, it's conducted by a psychologist named Liz Bonowitz, and it's not actually, it's not about apps, it's not even about technology. But it really does, I think, show very powerfully the difference between teaching for app enablement versus teaching for app dependence. So in the experiment, what happens is um, young children are brought into a lab and uh, um, they're randomly assigned to one of two groups. Um, all, all children are brought in one, one by one and they're, they're, they're shown this strange contraption. And it can do all sorts of things. It can squeak, it lights up, it has music, um, and they've never seen anything quite like it. So one half of the children, when they go into the lab, um, there is an experimenter there, and she shows them exactly how to use this toy. She shows them exactly how to use it, and then she leaves and lets the child play by themselves with the toy. Um, and there, there's someone behind the, the one-way mirror, uh, the, the two-way mirror, um, watching, and they record what the child does. Then the other half, they come into the lab, and um, again, an experimenter starts to tell them how to use the toy, but then the experimenter is um, interrupted and she has to leave before being able to explain anything. So the child is allowed to play with the toy, again, for however long that they want. And the child plays and the experimenters, they observe. And what they notice is that the kids who were um, not given any directions, the kids who were not told how to use this toy, they play with the toy for a lot longer and they come up with a lot of different ways of using the toy, more different ways of using the toy than the group who was told exactly how to use it. Um, and I think it really does illustrate that if you constrain kids, their actions will be constrained and their creativity will be constrained. Whereas if you let them explore freely, they'll come up with a lot of um, interesting and creative ways to use things. But why does this even matter? Apps are fun, they're convenient, they make life better. I'm not about to get rid of my apps. Um, so why should we bother teaching for app enablement instead of app dependence? Well, consider this quote by the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead um, that we use to uh, start the closing chapter of the book. And he says that civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. Now on the face of it, this sounds pretty great. You know, it makes life easy, right? You should not have to think about specific actions. And there are plenty of examples out there of apps that take care of mundane tasks for us, like laundry and grocery shopping and hailing a cab. Um, it makes life easier, and the idea is that it frees us up 
to engage in more meaningful, fulfilling experiences. But the big question we have to ask ourselves is where does this outsourcing end? So consider the movie Her. Has anyone seen this movie? Okay, a few people. Has anyone heard of this movie? Okay, so a little few more. Um, if you haven't seen or heard of it, I, I highly recommend uh, you going to see it, or I guess it's not in the theaters anymore. Um, it's really interesting, and I won't give anything away from the movie, um, but just okay. the basic premise is that there's this main character, his name is Theodore, and he falls in love with his operating system. <laughs> and that's pretty strange. Um, but I'm not actually even going to talk about that part of the movie. Um, because there's a scene at the very beginning of the movie that really sticks with me. Um, and it's when he's Theodore, the main character, he's sitting at his desk at the place where he works. And the place where he works is called beautifulhandwritenletters.com. Um, and the camera pans out from where he's sitting, and it starts to go over all the other people who are sitting at their cubicles working. And you can start to hear these people dictating surrogate letters um, from grandchildren to their grandparents, thanking them for the birthday present, um, from husband and wives to each other, thanking them for the anniversary or wishing that each other um, a happy anniversary. So basically these people are writing letters on behalf of other people. Um, so is this where we're heading? And we've had a lot of conversations actually about this in the iSchool at the University of Washington. Um, we had a whole debate about this very movie and what it says about our society and our relationship to technology. How much of ourselves and our relationships are we willing to outsource? Are we prepared to outsource child bearing to apps and technology? Are we already doing it? This is actually a product that is being sold, um, at least in the United States, called an activity seat. And, and you can, as you can see, the baby um, is looking at an iPad and who knows what app, um, and that becomes um, this baby's source of entertainment and kind of like a babysitter. But we end the book on a more optimistic note with a conversation between Howard and his then six-year-old six -year grandson, Oscar. And this really gives us hope that perhaps members of the app generation will find their way towards app enablement. So I'll just read from the closing part of the book here. So just as we were putting the final touches on the book, Howard um, had this conversation with his grandson, Oscar, about his experiences with digital media. And except for Howard's checking in with Oscar's parents to make sure it was okay, he wasn't prepared um, at any, in any way for the conversation. Um, and he allowed Howard to record our, their discussion. And in fact, when the interview was over, um, Oscar showed Howard how to shut off the recording function on his iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> so not surprisingly, as a child born in 2005, Oscar has always been surrounded by digital media. He is completely conversant and comfortable with the terminology and jargon. So Howard asked him, what would happen if Opa, which is what Oscar calls his grandfather, took away his iPhone. Oscar said, I would not be sad. I still have my computer. Howard said, oh, what's it like? Bigger than my mom's, Oscar says. Howard asks, what do you do on it? Oscar replies, search on toys, go to .com, to do something like herofactory.com, little things. I can write a little code into the line so I can play some sort of game. Howard was a bit taken aback at Oscar's ease with terminology like .com an activity, write a little code. And so Howard asked him if he ever Googled anything. The following exchange ensued. Oscar says, I Google everything. Amazon, like anything I need to go to Google or write it down. Howard said, you sound a bit exasperated. Oscar answers, kind of, but I'm not sure I know what exasperated means. Howard moved next to what one does and what one does not do with computers. And here, Oscar made a very clear distinction. Howard said, I grew up without computers. What do you think that was like? Oscar said, people would do all chores and more chores and more chores and no fun. Howard, no fun. Oscar, a little bit, but not much fun. Howard asked, do you use computers for school and study? 
Oscar answered, I don't really do those things. I just use my computers for fun. Howard asks, how do your mom and dad use computers? Oscar, for only one thing, work. My mom downloads things that she has to do, like does work about food in my school. At the time, Oscar's mother was doing graduate work in food science. So it appears then that Oscar makes a very sharp division. Kids, computers, fun, versus adults, no computer, no fun, <laughs> or adults, computers, work. Um, but were computers merely a source of pleasure and amusement for Oscar? So Howard decided to push him a little bit on what digital media did and did not allow him to do um, and what they meant to him. And this conversation proved most illuminating with respect to how Oscar sees the world, his digital worldview. So Howard asked, how do you feel when your parents say, put it away? Oscar says, feel a little blue, a little blue. Howard asks, how would you feel if your parents took all your computers and phones away for a few weeks? Oscar says, I feel a little blue, but I could actually have a little more freedom. Play with my toys, play with Aggie, his then eight month old sister, go to places with mom and dad. Howard asks, what do you mean by freedom? Oscar says, mostly people have technology. That was his word, no prompting from his grandfather. They are watching every game, and they do it all day, and they don't do anything else, but just watch TV. So you can play with toys and things like that without technology. Now, Oscar is certainly not a student of digital media, nor has he read about utopias and dystopias. And yet, at the tender age of six, he already senses that one can become a prisoner of the new technologies, and that a world beyond them is beckoning to be explored if there were just time and space to do so. He has figured out that there is virtue and even reward in figuring out things for yourself on your own time, in your own way. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Any questions to Dr. Davis? Uh, I was just wondering, um, uh, I'm, I'm just guessing that uh, um, research, which is, by the way, really incredible, like all the effort that went into this is just amazing. Um, if, even like an interview with a six-year-old that the interviewer is very careful in what and how he phrases the questions to not prime any um, response from the kid is just really amazing. But um, what I was wondering about is um, this research must have been very like US and Western centric. Mm -hmm. So how applicable do you think are these concepts to the Eastern culture and countries that are less developed where apps haven't gotten um, as big of an influence as they have in the um, more technological world? Yeah, well I think that's a very good point and we're definitely very clear in the book to say this is this research is a very Western perspective, really North American perspective. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that in less developed countries, I think it would be very different. And actually, um, in the United States, in more rural places of the United States, it's even different there because there's less connectivity. Um, however, I would be really interested to know um, what it's like in Korea and like Hong Kong, and, and actually I'm starting a new project that is um, working with a group in Hong Kong where we'll be surveying um, kids in international schools across Asia about how they use technology and compare that to the US just to see, because there's not a lot of research that is comparative like that, and it's really hard to conduct, I mean, our research was hard enough to you know figure it all out. Um, but yeah, we definitely need more uh, research that is comparative um, and not just looking at what kids are doing in different countries, but the interaction between their technology use and their cultural values and, um, and how the technology might be interacting with those culture, cultural values. Any other questions? Okay, uh, very interesting uh, research. Um, I'll pick on a, a really uh, minute point there. Uh, one of the slides you heard uh, 
uh, kids' writings uh, in the early uh, 1990s and late 2009-2010. And there was a conference where uh, kids who lived in uh, early 1990s wrote uh, more fantasy kind of uh, writings, whereas kids today are uh, writing more everyday mundane stuff. That seems a little bit contrary to what I was imagining, because from what I know, kids today are reading a lot more fantasy novels, right? Yeah, and that must yeah. have influenced what they uh, are writing. So, yeah. Have you done any research about what they are reading, actually? and how that influence what they write. Yeah, no, I know we were, um, one of our colleagues at the iSchool, uh, Eliza Driesen, she, um, has, she, fo she has focused in her career a lot on um, what kids read and how that's changed over the last 20 years. And you're right, um, there is this trend over the last 20 years um, towards more fantasy and dystopias and science fiction and things like that. Um, but we don't see it reflected in their writing, at least their writing, so these, it's important to say that their, this writing was produced at school. So the visual art was not produced at school, um, but the writing was. And so that's why in the book we talk a lot, and, and we have a journal article as well, talking a lot about trends in schooling over the last 20 years, um, and how that's changed, and really and talking with teachers as well, it's become very clear that they say that their teaching has changed and because they feel this pressure to teach to the test and, and really play it safe. So on the one hand, they are exposed to all sorts of fantasy fiction and all sorts of things like that. On the other hand, that's not reflected in their writing. I will say, however, that um, last year I conducted a year-long research study um, with some colleagues at the University of Washington and we looked at um, young people uh, who participate in fan fiction communities doing a lot of writing in online fan fiction communities with so three in particular, um, Harry Potter, Doctor Who, and My Little Pony. Um, and, and what we noticed is in, in that realm where it's nothing to do with school, there's tons of creativity that you can see. And I think that that really does show that that's an outlet. Now, most young people are not participating in fan fiction. I mean, that's a very small segment of most young people. Um, but the young people who are are finding all the support from other people um, in those communities uh, to really push their work. And they say that they feel that they've gotten a lot better in their writing. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. For uh, last year, I finished a small, very small article on esports, and it's very big here in Asia, and especially here in South Korea. So, how you thought of, about gaming? There's some pretty differences between the rest of the world and the uh, East. So. Yeah. So we don't focus on gaming in the book, um, but in, it's definitely becoming. I mean, it has been very big for many years. Um, and I understand there's a gaming curfew here. That's what your students told me in February. Um, yeah, so I think that gaming might be even more popular here than in the United States. Although my students in the United States are very into games. Um, and so I, I think that it's r really interesting. Actually, you know, one segment of our research, we looked at kids who were very involved in different kinds of digital media activities. And the ones who are very involved in games um, tended to explore different identities a little bit more um, in game worlds, especially um, in multiplayer, sort of open-ended um, worlds. And so with respect to identity, I think there's some really interesting things going on there. Um, also with respect to um, collaboration and, and that type of thing, and this balance between Competition and collaboration, I think, is really interesting. Um, one trend in the US right now is to recognize how popular games have become and to try and incorporate them in some way or incorporate game elements into education. So, this idea of gamification. Um, and so, I am doing some research on gamification right now. Um, but yeah, I think there's 
really interesting research to be done. Yes. Um, yeah, another question. Um, this was uh, very focused on the youth, but as I especially experienced here in Korea, where pretty much everybody has, uh, like, when I'm on the subway, everybody's on the phone. It doesn't matter if they're 16 or uh, 50 playing some game on, uh, while commuting. Um, couldn't one also generalize this um, notion of um, having finding identity, intimacy, and imagination um, in a more like not um, demographics that is young, but also the older one. Oh, sure. The thing, though, that is distinct and important to think about for young people in particular is that identity development really it happens in adolescence. And so and it happens throughout the rest of your life, but there's a lot of important identity work that happens in adolescence. And for, for this generation of young people, they're kind of the first to have these technologies um, to develop their identities with. Whereas older people, they're expressing themselves through technology as well, but they've done that really important identity work in a pre-digital time. And I think that, that that shift to me is so interesting. And, um, and so that's, you know, we don't yet know how, will that, will that lead to any meaningful differences down the road? Because it's still happening, so we don't really know. Um, but sure, yeah, I think that we see a lot of the same things, but because of their developmental significance during youth, I think it's it's really important to pay particular attention to that. Good. Yes. Uh, two more. Could you speak on the I think you can try to use jealousy by posting Sometimes they share videos or writings, but um, I think usually they try to use some channels. So uh, I wonder if it connects to the increase in the Do you have any research? Yeah, we, um, so, so this is, the question is about jealousy. And, and so we definitely have talked a lot to the, this came up a lot actually in our interviews with young people, um, how they, they said that often when they see what their friends are posting online on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, they feel like the pictures make them look so happy and popular, and they feel inside that they're not measuring up, and they feel like they're, you know, they feel a little bit insecure. And so it's a really, and that, that's part of this idea of the package self and performing your identity. Um, you're not going to perform like an unattractive or kind of a failing identity. Usually, people put forth their best self online, particularly the you know places like Facebook, where it's so public. Um, and so, I think that one result is that you don't see all the things that don't go right. And so, but of course, when we're looking, we know everything how we're feeling inside. Um, and to compare how we're feeling inside to what we see other people presenting online, there may be this disconnect. And as a result, you may start to feel a little inadequate. And we definitely heard, um, particularly from girls, that they felt that way when they um, were online. So yeah, it's a great question. So it was very interesting to you know, uh, see the, how the new app generation is different from like, ours. But I was just wondering, if the this app generation, they see the whole world through, uh, through the viewing glass as an app, then the app itself is, you know, it's, it's dismantled by each function. So wouldn't that affect uh, this new generation's view towards the world, or is the world is like disconnected and they're dismantled by each function? Not as That's a That's really interesting, yeah. So, so this is the idea of the app mentality. And, and when we were first thinking about apps and just how they seemed to fit what we were seeing, it was really, it's kind of an algorithmic way of thinking. So if this, then that, you know, and I should get instant answers to everything. So, you know, what you're saying is um, this kind of um, siloing effect of, of experience, which that could be part of it, but what we were really focusing on 
is the um, the kind of instantaneous and very concrete, immediate um, facts. And and as a, the flip side of that is, there's not very much comfort with ambiguity or trying to you know, if you're wrestling with a complex question, the the instinct is to Google it and find an immediate answer right away, and you're done. Whereas Without that, without Google, you're kind of forced to think a little bit and to draw on your inner resources to really muddle through this complex question. And so I think that's the part of the app mentality that we're really focusing on. Um, but whether or not we start to silo our experiences, I think that's. I think it can go either way, actually. Um, some teams that we talked with, um, they make very clear distinctions. Um, <coughs> in terms of how they use different platforms and they don't have any overlap. Others have complete overlap and it's all unified, it's all together. So you definitely see different patterns. It can be a quite personal question, but I just wonder, since you have the research, if you have a child, will you advocate them with digital things on apps or just let them say Yes, no, that's a great question. Actually, I'm teaching a class right now um, for uh, the Masters of Information and Library Science. Um, and we it's a child development course, and we're looking at different stages of child development and the effects of digital media at each stage. And so in the first week, no, the second week, we talked a lot about play and how important play is to early child development. And then we were talking about, well, we had this whole discussion about is playing on, uh, is, is taking a broom and pretending it's a, a horse the same as, as playing or riding a horse in Minecraft? Um, and, and so we had a huge discussion, and a lot of the students are parents and talking about you know, how much they do and don't let their children um, play with technology. And I, you know, I think I have two, I don't have any children, but I have two younger, a lot younger sisters. So they're age 19 and 20. So I was a teenager when they were born. And so I've watched them grow up with technology. And I th I'm pretty sure that if and when I have children, I will definitely let them play with technology, use technology, um, but I will also um, try and moderate that and 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 put technology away and just have some time where you're just completely outside. I do think that's important. Um, but really, the the message that we're trying to convey in the book is balance. So it's it's not getting rid of technology because that would be silly. Because it's here, obviously, and in many ways, it has made life much better. It's you know it's there are wonderful opportunities. Um, but at the same time it's important to not uh, forget what life was like before and the good parts of it and to try and hold on to those. Um, Dr. Davis, I'm wondering whether you have a research with you mentally and physically retarded or disabled use regarding the similar uh, research. Yeah, I myself have not um, <coughs> conducted research with um, kids with learning disabilities or um, disabled in other ways, but some of my colleagues do, and, um, and particularly we have one professor who does health informatics research and just showing how online communities actually can be great places for kids who are very sick to, and they maybe can't get out in the, in the real world, but, but digital media and online communities can provide a way for them to meet people, and um, so that's very positive. Um, we have another colleague who actually designs technology for people with disabilities so that the technology responds to their uh, he actually calls it ability-based designs, so that the technology adapts to uh, the person rather than the person trying to adapt to the technology. Um, but I do think that there are lots of great opportunities. Um, I know there's a lot of interest right now um, in using technology um, to support kids with autism, um, particularly their social development skills. 
Um, actually, at this conference that I'm at yesterday, I was at a presentation where they developed a, a tool to support kids' uh, social pretend play. And they think that this tool can be really supportive for kids with autism, giving them certain cues to help them detect social signals um, that are very hard for them to detect. Uh, have you ever thought about what uh, what generation it will be after the X generation? Oh, that's a good question. What's next? <laughs> a hologram uh, <laughs> generation? Yeah, uh, I don't know. It, it, uh, well, that, that actually raises a a really interesting question that I have thought about. Is right now it seems that the dominant way for us to access different platforms is through apps and that you know at the information school all of our students want to design the coolest new app that's like the focus but that can, there's no way that can last for so much too much longer so what would be the next thing what will be the next way uh, or the next yeah the next way for us to access different um, platforms and I don't know it'll be very interesting and so I'll be very interested to see what what's the next generation. Wonderful. Any okay. questions? More questions? No. Oh, okay. I have Stick a about question about regarding the identity. So you mentioned that the, in this app generation, the the exploration and the acceptance of the the user's identity is it got broader. So have you? thought about you know Twitter, you know, Facebook and Apple, all of those uh, companies are, you know, trying to they are promoting themselves as as a you know acceptance in order to, you know, sell more products. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't so so the app generations, those, you know, trends to the identity might, you know, related to those companies, you know, strategic Oh yeah, I think that's really purposes. important. And I think that's really another reason why it's very important to educate um, kids about the corporate side of these platforms and how their algorithms are designed to maximize their bottom line. And so they're gonna show you good things, and not bad things, so that when you see their ads, you're more likely to buy their products. Um, and it's really important to know how Facebook's algorithm um, works and shapes what we see and what we don't see and you know all of these platforms have their own special algorithms that's really shaping our experience and I don't think most most people don't think about it no matter what age they are um, but particularly young people and so I think that's a really important literacy to to uh, teach kids so that that means so we can keep talking about this literacy and the balance, but this literacy and balance cannot be, you know, taught through current traditional education system, right? So are you suggesting that there should be third person who is teaching them, uh, like specifically focus on this information literacy? Well, that's actually, you know, um, there uh, there are teachers in the U.S. in, in kindergarten through twelve system, uh, grade twelve who they are teaching um, media literacy and digital literacy, digital citizenship, and that's becoming a really big focus in the United States. And um, a lot of the time it's the librarians, actually, who are doing that education. And um, yeah, I, they're, and there are whole curricula that have been developed. A very popular um, organization in the United States is called Common Sense Media, and they've developed a whole series of curricula um, to teach digital literacy. Uh, so yeah, it's it's actually becoming a formal focus in schools. Can I think, uh, do you like to briefly like maybe your next studies going to be of your, your, your research? Sure. So um, I have two projects coming up. Um, one of them is working in libraries in the United States, public libraries to develop a suite of professional development resources so that librarians can be supported in their efforts to introduce technology into their activities with young people. Um, and then another project, I'm developing a digital badge system at a, an after-school science um, program in Seattle 
where the digital badges, if, if you're familiar with the idea of badges like Boy Scout badges or Girl Scout badges, kind of show you what skills you have, digital badges are a digital version of that. And so I'm developing this badge system to recognize um, out-of-school learning. Because in out-of-school learning, you don't really get grades or credentials in, the, in this uh, traditional sense. So um, we're going to develop that to try and recognize what kids are doing outside of school. Thank you. Let's keep uh, our warm I have an announcement. We have a, another distinguished lecturer coming at 3 30. I really appreciate many of you. Will, we are letting you early, but we'll.